I think I mentioned in the opening remarks that we planned each of our topics very carefully so we could be sure to address some of the, the issues that people face when they're just getting started in the field. Um, I think that shows most clearly with this career track, and I, I hope you're going to find these tracks today, uh, these talks today, useful and fascinating. Speaking of useful and fascinating, that's a great segue to introducing our first speaker, uh, Ryan Kovar, is a distinguished security strategist at Splunk. One of the biggest challenges facing people trying to break into security is that there's an awful lot about what it's like to work in the field that you just don't know probably until you actually get into the field and you've been around for at least a little while. Like it's, and you can't know a lot of this stuff until you've been exposed to it. This not only limits our options when we're just starting out, but kind of creates that catch 22. How can you chart a career path through security if you need to already be in security to know what you can do in security? So when I mentioned this to Ryan, he totally understood what I was getting at, and, and he immediately volunteered to help. Uh, so not only does Ryan have a lot of experience with various types of cybersecurity roles, but he's really just a, a lively, engaging speaker. I, I know you're going to love this talk. I want to work in cybersecurity, whatever that means. So take it away, Ryan. Thank you very much, David. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. This is truly one of the passions I've had in my career is helping other people get to where I am. Um, and more importantly, discuss all the different ways that how I got to where I am is not applicable at all to anyone else. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy the talk. Um, I tried to pick the most cybery background I could. I think this is a screen grab from CSI Cyber, so you know it's real. Uh, just a quick disclaimer here, because I work for a vendor, Splunk. Uh, they have some very strong feelings about me making sure I don't say anything that people would buy software from or based on stock. So just an overall head of heads up, do not buy stock on anything I say. Uh, I lie often. There's very little worth in anything I talk about if it's around our products. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but for the most part, it's our legal ease. Quick agenda here. Uh, this is what I used to look like before I got a haircut uh, and a beard trim and before I got vaccinated. But I'm going to quickly go over some of my background and what we're doing or what I've done in my career and try to set a stage for just my journey and then try to synthesize that down to things that might be helpful for you. Um, in order to make a more interesting talk and in order to show things that are more relevant, I actually created a survey with a lot of information on it. Um, so there's a lot of statistics and numbers uh, that maybe are even true. We'll, we'll find out as we go. Uh, from that, I was able to derive a lot of what I consider to be interesting findings around the different jobs that exist in the field today. And I also came up with a lot of findings of uh, basically the hidden secrets of the cybersecurity community, job market, or myths, frankly, that I just want to talk about a little bit. They either came up in the comments to the survey or comments from my peers as we kind of went through this process. And finally, I'm gonna give a little bit of information about where I can see our industry going because I had a lot of questions from people who are new to our industry about, oh my God, what job should I get into? I have to make my career decision now. I have to come up with the next stage now. So I'm gonna give my hot takes on what that means and we'll go from there. But first, I need to gain your trust. Uh, if there's one book I can ever recommend every person reading in any industry is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And a big part of that is introducing yourself and saying hello. So uh, it's me, Ryan, I'm here in front of you. David has already given me a glowing uh, introduction. A little bit more about myself. I work at Splunk today. I've done this for about 20 years, not working at Splunk, but cybersecurity over 20 years. Uh, I've done speaking all over the world uh, my background is really in nation state hunting and what I would call knife fighting threat intelligence, uh, pretty in close with the adversary. Since I've been at Splunk, I'm probably best known for something called the boss of the sock, which is a, an idea that I had that I was able to create with one of my best friends. Uh, and I've never been able to print from my home printer or any printer in my Splunk offices around the world. So fun fact about me for an icebreaker. But what about my career? Uh, I have done many things. And I started by joining the US Navy. Um, some background about me, I barely graduated high school, I think I had a GPA of 1.995. Uh, 
Um, I'm a very smart person. This isn't a humble brag. I recognize that, but I did horrible in school. It was just not something that I was very interested in at the time. By the time I graduated high school, I was actually had been working 40 to 50 hour work weeks and other jobs all the way through my high school career. And I joined the Navy because I literally found out that all my other friends were going to places like Caltech and Princeton and MIT, and I had just kind of forgotten about it. So I looked around, I tried to join the army, uh, I wanted to go drive tanks and they said, no, you have to go into military intelligence. I said, that doesn't sound fun. Uh, the Marines were too hard and the Air Force said, uh, we, you're just not who we want in a person. So I joined the Navy and joined as a IT, as an information system technician. And I was stationed on this ship, the USS Kitty Hawk. I am actually somewhere in the bowels of that ship when this photo was taken off the coast of Hong Kong. And my first job on the USS Kitty Hawk was pulling uh, Cat5 cable. So pulling the network cable off the ship, I pulled, uh, I actually still have some of my metrics of uh, performance metrics from that year. I pulled 5,397 feet of cable, uh, replacing coax cable with BNC vampire taps, um, which really shows my age. I think Phil and, Phil and David are stroking their beards right now going, yes, I know those. Uh, but many of you probably have never seen a BNC connector. Much of what the work I did by the time I left the Navy. Now I realize I went into the Navy and computers with no knowledge about computers other than how to configure Duke Nukem uh, video game to play multiplayer on TCP IP. Uh, but most of what I did there was actually learning networking. So I, by the time I got out of the Navy, I had an MCSE, I had a CCNA, uh, and I did a lot of system administration for Unix and Windows. Uh, I actually helped, you know, I ran a entire shop of people. So I had about 25 people reporting into me technically who, you know, administered a network for 5,300 people on the ship. Uh, we had something like 60 routers, uh, 50 servers all over the place doing things. And that's what I did. That's where I cut my teeth. So after three years, 10 months, nine days, I got out of the Navy, but I ticked a lot of boxes. I filled a lot of my career buckets because I fell in love with the industry and I knew that I wanted to do things in information technology, IT. Uh, so while I was in the Navy, I, I learned networking, I learned Windows and Unix. Um, and what worked really well for me long term is I got a security clearance, uh, which set me up for my next roles. And then I also learned basic cybersecurity, uh, which is obviously where I am today. After that, I was uh, a contractor for the US Navy, but then eventually I became, within a couple of months, I was asked to fly out to London and I worked for the National Crime Agency, which at the time was called a National Criminal Investigative Service, uh, which is a little confusing because I was in the Navy and then I worked for NCIS, but that's a long story. Point here is I went out there as a contractor, stayed for several years and helped support their information systems uh, around the all of Europe. And what I found interesting for that job was I got to do really advanced networking on new systems across all of Europe I learned basic programming uh, because, and this is an interesting part, uh, my job was much easier than what I had been doing before from a technical point of view. I actually had a lot of time on my hands. And the reason I took the job uh, was because I wanted to travel Europe. I wanted to live in Europe. I wanted to travel easily. And so I took what in reality was almost a career setback role. It was a lesser position than what I'd done before for the opportunity to travel because I was young and I wanted to do something different. But while I was there, I really only had about an hour of work a day so I was able to learn Visual Basic. I was able to learn Bash scripting. I was able to learn VB script. I was able, you know, sadly I learned some Delphi. Uh, but the point is I was able to check a whole bunch of boxes and further my career, even in a role that wasn't that interesting. It was basically a, a very glorified help desk. Uh, from that, I moved into a company called KBMG, a Knowledge Based Management Group, which is part of Wonderman. Wonderman is one of the largest marketing conglomerates in the world that no one's heard of, uh, but they have tens of thousands of employees globally. And this company actually did big data for marketing. Uh, they crunched data to provide information for companies that were doing marketing campaigns and they did it so that it could be more effective in their targeted advertising. Uh, I had nothing to do with that, but it's the first time I was introduced to the concept of big data and they truly did big data. They used mainframes, they used SaaS jobs. Uh, the big data analysts for this company would start a analysis job at like 9 a.m. on Monday and go get a cup of coffee. And by Thursday, they had the results. But while I was there, I was able to pivot the skills that I had in security and recognize that this company didn't have what it needed to go to that next stage. And so I became the person in charge of answering customer audits. We had over 75 customer audits a year uh, that were all around uh, the fact that we held customers' data 
and they would come to us and audit us. So I was able to respond back to that. I learned PCI compliance. I used Sarbane, used, learned Sarbane Oxley compliance. And from that, I was actually able to come up with a security plan for the company and develop them for them a SOC. I also created a NOC while I was at the company. And so we were able to kind of expand what we were doing. And I also learned the concepts of what we would now call big data. From there, I was asked by a, well, my best friend in the Navy. He actually had started up and was working at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So I went to DARPA and I started working as a uh, le helping lead a team of nation state hunters to defend DARPA. If you're not familiar with DARPA, they are the Blue Sky Research um, Organization for the Department of Defense in the US military. They created things like the internet and the stealth bomber and the M16. Uh, they have a lot of huge successes and obviously are very interesting to adversaries of the United States for actually ta targeting them and trying to find the information that DARPA is working on. So the job was fascinating and I learned more. It, it was kind of like doing a PhD in cybersecurity very quickly. Uh, I learned about nation state hunting. I learned report writing. I learned malware analysis. And for the first time in my life, and it was actually using the tool Splunk where I work now, is I was able to start looking at terabytes of data and doing large scale analysis rather than looking at events and trying to figure out what was going on. I was actually starting to do what now we would call hunting. I was thinking about hypotheses and I was kind of going through different steps. I, I joined DARPA in about 2012, uh, right when a lot of what we think of today as average was really brand new um, or really just starting to get in the public view. APT groups were just really getting advertised as APT groups, uh, for example. So a lot of things going on there and that's where I checked more boxes or as you'll find out here what I talk about soon, I filled my career buckets. Along the way, I was able to get a master's degree in uh, information system security uh, through the University of Westminster in London. This was very important to me because I do not have an undergraduate degree. I only have a graduate degree. In the United Kingdom, they actually let you, um, basically you do hours and hours of interviews and rating tests, and you can uh, have an assumption of knowledge for a bachelor's degree and go on to a graduate degree. For me, by the time I took my graduate degree uh, and got a master's degree, I was um, already pretty much a subject matter expert in what I was doing. And so I will not necessarily say a lot of the coursework was useful for me. What was phenomenally useful for me and is probably the biggest thing and the biggest career enhancer that I've had from that program is I was writing tens of pages a week. And you know my thesis was over 75 pages of prose and research and statistics. And I had never been focused on that. And this was huge for me. And today I write reams of paper uh, for Splunk. Uh, I think I'm the most prolific blogger that we have. And so this was hugely uh, beneficial for my eventual goals. Also, because I don't have a college degree for undergraduate, I was getting excluded from a lot of jobs when I would apply. And so having a master's degree for me was able to fill a box for HR and let me go through. Finally, I worked at Splunk where I work now. I travel all over the world. I run CTFs, I give talks like I am today. I do innovative research, I do wonderful things. I love my job, it's a great place to work. Uh, but once again, I started checking, checking off boxes. And one that's very relevant today is I was able to learn and lean into public speaking, which has been hugely beneficial for my career. One of the wonderful things about SANS is it lets you speak all over the world, virtually and in person. And I'm here today partly because of that experience that I got from working at Splunk. So this is not too bad for someone who failed first grade math. Um, it's something that I've worked through and I'm gonna call back to this later on in the talk. Uh, but I say this because I consider myself and I believe most people I work with would consider myself one of the most technical people at Splunk. Uh, but I have a very poor understanding of math overall. And more importantly, this feeds into my ability to develop uh, and write Python code. I can read Python, I can edit Python, I can move my classes and I can move my functions and everything like that. But if you were to put a Python test in front of me and said, hey, go write a Shannon entropy function and do that in 20 minutes, I would fail. So that's my hidden secret. It's not a shame at all because I'm very successful at what I've done, but so that you can look at someone's glowing career and they're gonna have different places there. They're not as strong as you are. And I think this is important uh, to know that everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. This happens to be one of mine. Um, for those who are wondering, yes, that was my first grade report card. And yes, the Mrs. Johnson, um, may she rot, failed me in first grade. So <clears throat> I wanna talk about something here that I alluded to briefly, the concept of buckets. 
my career mentor, one of my personal mentors is Susan St. Ledger. She is now the president of Okta. She used to be the president of Splunk. She's an incredible woman. Uh, she started off as an NSA analyst, Intel analyst. Eventually she became a system administrator and worked in Sun. Uh, she was a, a sales engineer and then she became a, uh, she kind of said, hey, I just want to make a lot of money. So she turned into a salesperson and now she runs global sales for giant companies. And she has this concept uh, that I spoke about at the SAN CTI Summit, and I think it's why David kind of asked me to present today about a career bucket list. And her point is, you know, we usually think of a career as a ladder, and you're kind of going through your career in a ladder format, which is very applicable for somewhere like, um, and this is not one good or bad, it's somewhat very good for somewhere like General Electric or Microsoft or large companies that have a set progression of, you know, laddered steps. Military is the same idea. But for most of us, you don't have that. Um, until I joined Splunk, I'd never actually had a promotion. I had had to quit my job and find a new job at a higher role. Um, and I think for many people in our industry, that's very typical. So she has this concept of think about where you want to be next year. Think about where you want to be in five years. And instead of thinking like, and in order to do that, I need to have senior on my name. Think about what skills do I need to accumulate to actually move to that next area? What do I need to fill in my bucket before I can put it down? For her, because she wanted to become a sales leader, she had things like understanding profit and loss of a company and being able to work internationally outside of just America and be able to sell to different regions. Obviously, this has, her goals have nothing to do with what we do in cybersecurity. But if you look at my goals, these are the things I looked at for where I am today. And I can actually draw directly back to, I didn't realize I was doing this or I didn't have a cognitive thought model to arrange it on. But if I thought about where I am, my current role as a distinguished security strategist, here were the career buckets that I had to fill in order to get to that role. And I have another career bucket list of where I want to go after this that I'm working on today. And so I say this a little bit as of advice and a little bit to format the rest of my talk. As I'm talking about different job roles and you're thinking about for the whole day, the different things that you can do, I highly recommend using this thought model, this cognitive thought model of kind of going through the options, because a lot of times it's not about getting that next promotion, it's about unlocking your next achievement. Um, and hopefully this resonates for you as much as it did for me. So let's talk about fake numbers and Colorado senders. Um, Colorado senators, uh, Bob Udell, uh, these are wonderful people who did great work on um, preserving the American West and Southwest. We're not really here to talk about beautiful landscape though. What I wanted to do is discuss what is the landscape of cybersecurity jobs. And I was about to make a really awesome mind map and do a whole bunch of work to actually talk about that. And then I realized this lovely gentleman, Henry, had actually done the hard work. Um, I'm gonna post all the links that I publish in this blog or this talk in my speaker room afterwards. So feel free not to screen share or worry about that. But Henry, he's now on Rev3, published this mind map available. Uh, I learned about it through uh, Richard Bakelitz's blog but I think he did a really good job of just breaking down what the cybersecurity community and the domains of knowledge are. Um, it's kind of a more up-to-date version of what you see in the CISSP. There's some places I could quibble on, you know, for example, I might have a full breakout for cloud, uh, but Henry has reduced that into application security. Um, I might expand physical security because my experience in the US government, I know there's more roles that have intersections with physical security than just IoT security. Um, for example, he doesn't have ICS security. Uh, so Leslie later on today, I assume will be beating him up with giant knives. But overall, I think this is a phenomenal piece of work and I really enjoy it. And what I like about it for people new to the career is it shows the breadth of our domain. I think because you're attending a SANS conference, you're probably very comfortable with things in incident response and you know penetration testing and maybe threat intelligence, hopefully user education. But you not know, might not know about all the things around governance or frameworks and standards or security architecture. So if I distill this down, here's the giant areas that I think he grouped everything into. And I really like this as an area to frame the different places you can go in your career. If you think about different buckets you're going to have to fill, you're going to have to fill a lot of different buckets in security architecture than if you decide to go into a role of threat intelligence or risk assessment. But saying that, let's break that down further. This is how I kind of see the different areas of jobs. Um, for blue team, you obviously have a lot of blue team jobs, being a network defender or a SOC analyst. Um, for threat intelligence or Intel, you're gonna be in Intel jobs. 
If you're interested in um, you know, security testing, then red team jobs. If you're doing CICD or DevSecOps, you're gonna be in the DevSecOps jobs world. And obviously engineering is a very amorphous blob, but if you're a person who really enjoys creating systems that work together to defend networks, you're probably gonna be more in the engineering jobs. So I took that information and I said, hey, I really wanna think more about this and I wanna find out what my peers are doing. So I made a survey. And when I wrote the survey, I, I put in it that I was gonna publish all the results. So to give you an idea of what was in the survey, there were some general demographics where I wanted to draw some spurious conclusions. I wanted to find out what titles people's had, what certs they valued or didn't value, how technical they felt they were and where they saw the future of our industry going. The survey only took about three minutes to take. I published the results, surveymonkey.com. You can actually go to the published results from SurveyMonkey, or I have the distilled results in a CSV format here on my GitHub. As I said, I'll publish this in my hallway room after this talk. Um, the cert value and job roles are also slightly modified where I've done groupings, and I'll talk about this later. But if you just want the raw results, new to cyber is what you want. So I had 510 responses, primarily gathered from Twitter and LinkedIn and friends, uh, which leads us to something I need to talk about. There is sample bias in my data. Uh, Kyle Maxwell, a good friend of ours, brought this up immediately. Uh, I just want to point out that as you're going through the survey, realize that I published this to get more data from people who were in the um, from people who were in um, on Twitter and on LinkedIn primarily, and then also my friends and people who were involved with SAMS. So if you follow me on Twitter, you're probably interested in cybersecurity or you're probably interested in Splunk, or you're interested in Bernie's Mountain Dogs or uh, cooking. So that's that demographic. Um, the people who are at SANS, you know, you're gonna have a lot of people who focus on red team and blue team. And I also publish to my coworkers at Splunk, which is a software sales company. So there's gonna be a slight bias, a sample bias of people from there. But just keep that in mind, I'll call that out as we go through, but I just wanted to give you a little background of the data that I created. Um, 310 of the responses were from America, which makes sense. That's where the majority of people I know in the world are. I also speak English. I speak very colloquial English. So I apologize for those of you who are English as second language. Um, you are incredible human beings and thank you for putting up with me. Um, so you can see that most of the people who respond to this, an English survey written by an American were in nations that spoke English uh, or have a high comprehension of English and use it as a national language. So not a lot of surprises there. 81% men, 16% women, less than 1% of people who identify as neither man or woman. This anecdotally to me feels like it's dead on, at least in my career. Sadly, I, I wanna see those numbers change. Uh, not everyone should look like me, but I feel like this is probably fairly anecdotally correct. Uh, this was more interesting to me. 40% of the people who responded were between 35 and 44. 67% um, total between 25 and 44 with a couple people, you know, 23% over. So this shows the breadth. It also shows my peer group is 35 to 44. Um, so perhaps not surprising the more people who follow me and or know me are in that grouping of 35 to 44. This is interesting as well. Not surprising though, that people who are 35 to 44 and work in IT security have been doing this for 11 to 20 years. A huge shout out to those wonderful warriors who've been doing this for over 41 years. Uh, we have all learned from you and stand on the shoulders of giants. So if you're here today listening, thank you for all that you do. Uh, although I also don't know why, uh, because if you're doing this for 41 years, you are certainly not new to cyber. 21.4% worked in telco, 14% worked in software sales. I think the software sales, once again, that's showing that Splunk employee bias of people that I've worked with or currently work with, but I don't think this is a poor. 52% of people graduated or went to some college. I think I could have asked this question better, but I think um, it gives us a good idea for what people are looking at when they responded. All of this is relevant because it drives the information for what I'm gonna be talking about shortly, which are the jobs. So from this, I was really interested in what are the jobs that people had? What are the different roles that people exist today? Because the roles that exist today are the roles that you being new to cyber are applying for. So I thought it would be very useful for you to find out what those jobs are. These are the big ones that came up. Cyber, 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 cyber. A lot of cyber, a lot of the words with the word security. This is just a word cloud derived from all the different titles that people had with some of the seniority things scraped out. Um, you know, analyst, engineer, architect, sales, CTI, research. Um, 
this was useful, but I think I needed to actually groom the data a little bit more. And so I kind of went one level deeper and took a look at it here. So the 10 most common job titles for people that responded to my survey was security engineer, security architect. These are not surprising, security analyst. I was a little surprised to see so many people with the title CISO uh, respond back, uh, which was wonderful. Um, sales engineer drops in. This is a good time to point out that I actually was gonna do this a whole different way and do, I had written some interesting Python, sorry, copy and pasted some interesting Python to do some scraping of things like indeed.com and monster jobs and LinkedIn, and then realized I was about to break a whole bunch of terms of service in EULA. And so I chose not to do that. But I can say anecdotally from all the research I did, these job titles certainly resonate with me as one of the most popular job titles that exist. Now, usually there's going to be some prefix, prefix or suffix to what these jobs are. Um, so maybe it is a database security architect, maybe it is a cloud security analyst, but those core things of what they are kind of resonate to me. So I, I feel very comfortable in presenting this to you. So let's do a quick deep dive into what some of these more popular roles are. And I'm gonna go talk about them, what they are and hopefully demystify them and explain to you what they kind of can be and where you can get into them. So security engineer. Uh, I have been a security engineer three times in my career and those three times have never been the same job responsibilities. I do truly believe that this is the ultimate catch-all title for our community. Uh, people who have a security engineer title may very well be doing engineer type of work of maintaining and creating systems to help secure information technology. But a lot of times it's just a default, they're in the engineering org, so we're going to apply the title of security engineer. Um, I often find that people who are in a security engineer role are very sysadmin y. Uh, this is not in any way a bad thing. I am at the heart of my career a sysadmin. Uh, my neck beard shows that. Uh, but it could be a variety of things. Um, and just be aware. I would say uh, one interesting story about this what I have been a security engineer for most of my career. Uh, my father in law, who's a civil engineer, used to make quite a bit of fun of me because his belief is you don't get to be called an engineer unless when you screw up, people die. And obviously when I screw up, um, a website is blocked and people can't get to their, their morning news. So um, he's a grumpy old man and don't believe him. So we'll go from there. Security architect, this is probably the second most utilized catch-all title in my opinion. Um, my very good best friend uh, at Splunk, Dave Harold. Uh, Dave Harold and I have done a lot of co-presentations -pre at SANS. You may have seen us before if you're part of that community. Uh, he and I created the boss of the SOC together. For three years, I had the title of security strategist. He had the title of security architect. We did the same job. We literally had the same responsibilities, the same uh, bonus structures. Everything was involved was exactly the same. Saying that, when I talk to someone who says that they are a security architect at a company, my bias, my assumption is that they're going to be doing something less hands-on with code or with, um, with uh, you know, connecting systems but they're gonna be doing a lot more things like, a perfect example would be, they're not going to be implementing a data loss prevention solution, but they will be creating a company strategy for data loss prevention or DLP. That's kind of my mental breakdown of how I think that role should be. That's what I think of when someone says they are a security architect. The reality is God only knows what your actual job is, roles and responsibilities change. Security consultant, I find this title usually is at very large companies where a consultant is actually part of the information security organization and they consult internally. So they're consulting on other business units within a company or they're part of a consultancy firm like a big five like Deloitte or PwC or a technology firm like Accenture where you're actually paid to go out and help customers. Um, I call this an expert generalist because no one is a security consultant. They are a something security consultant. They are a PCI security consultant. They are a, um, you know, they, they are a nation state hunting security consultant. You're being called in to do something very specific uh, as outsourced labor or to consult upon something else that someone is doing. A uh, very popular title, um, but really I think this one is not catch all. This tends to have very specific meaning. Uh, security or threat or something analyst. Um, 
analyst here is the keyword. I rarely see people who have the word analyst in their title who are not analyzing data, which sounds ridiculous to say, but if we look at all the other titles I just talked about, engineer and architect, you can see why I'm belaboring that point. Um, a lot of times, they may be someone who's engineering, they may be putting together security appliances, but hopefully what their job is, is actually looking at data. If they're a security analyst or threat analyst, a lot of times they're the ones who are looking at a security operations center alerts, they're looking at SIM alerts, they're, you know, they're a Splunk customer, they're writing queries, they're looking at enterprise security, um, you know, maybe they're using Azure, whatever it be, but they're, they're usually looking and comprehending alerts or analyzing security information to make uh, defend in the network. So they are usually reactive to something that's happening by an adversary or compliance or something like that. Um, threat intelligence analyst. This is different than a security or threat analyst in my opinion. Most people who actually say that they are a cyber threat intelligence analyst or CTI, they work in the world of indicators of compromise. They work with adversaries. They work on things that are very specific about what adversaries do and how they respond to them. Um, they may work on creating automation that actually allows them to scale and amplify what these people are doing. Uh, but at the end of it, they are very, very concentrated on working on adversary behavior and then creating data around that. Uh, if you're interested in this, I'm gonna do a plug for the SAN CTI Summit, uh, which I often help with every year happens in January, January timeframe, end of January, take a look at it. It's a great summit, wonderful people. Sales engineer and overlay. I'm adding this in for a couple of reasons. One, um, this is something that a lot of people don't think of. I had a bias against the world of sales engineers when before I joined Splunk. Uh, I thought they were lovely people, but it was certainly nothing I wanted to do. Um, since I've been at Splunk and since I've worked with more vendors, I can honestly say some of the smartest people that I've ever worked with in my life work within the vendor community. They work as sales engineers or like myself, I'm not a sales engineer, but I am also known as an overlay, which means I'm the person that sales engineers go to for assistance around specific domain expertise subjects. Since you're new to your career, I know a lot of what you're going to hear about at SANS, a lot of what we hear about in the community are about these SOC roles. But if you have an interest in people, you may want to consider looking at a sales engineer job. Uh, you can have deep domain expertise, um, find a vendor uh, that focuses on cybersecurity and dig in. Um, I have a whole bunch of people I just have been interviewing and working with at Splunk who are very junior, they're 22 or 23, early, early career, right out of college. They have degrees in like discrete mathematics from Champaign and Urbana or computer science from Carnegie Mellon, phenomenal programs. I said, why are you, why'd you choose to become a sales engineer? And uh, one of the young women's answers was, oh, it's because um, I really like technology, but I really like people too. And I also want to make a lot of money. And if those are at all in your career bucket list, uh, becoming a sales engineer or overlay or working for a vendor uh, is a phenomenal option. I highly recommend considering it because uh, I don't think a lot of people do. I certainly had, didn't before I started working at Splunk. And finally, I wanted to talk about leaders. Um, a different trend that I'm noticing for people that I mentor is that a lot of early career people are driven to, I need to get on the management track. I need to become a leader. I need to be a boss. All of which is wonderful. Uh, it's not something that I was particularly driven to at 23, 24, uh, but different strokes. So if you become a leader in the cybersecurity community, and there's a lot of different roles, you could be a CISO. Uh, there's a new title called BISO, which is Business Information Security Officer. Um, a vice president or a director or even a manager, you need to understand what you do for a living changes. And you're probably not walking in the door as one of these if you're new to cyber, but this may be your next goal. And so I wanted to talk about this because for most leaders in cybersecurity, you need to recognize, and let me be very clear here, if you work in cybersecurity, you do not make profit for a company unless you work at a vendor. Uh, but for 95% of us, you do not result in profit. The only amendment to that is if you work in fraud, uh, which probably means you're not at this talk, but if you work in fraud, you can actually turn profits. But otherwise, you are a cost center and a reluctant part of why organizations do business. And so you have to, as a leader in cybersecurity, show the value of your team and show the value of what people do um, to the leadership of a company. And that is the primary goal of what these leaders do. Now, obviously there's a whole bunch of things around managing and inspiring, but the actual 
part that they're really valuable for is a CISO's job is not to defend a company. It is to make sure that the business runs and that they are supported with the least amount of money spent for the most security that they can get. So if you understand the motivations behind what leaders do, it'll help your job and also help you pick where you want to go for a career. So now I'm going to, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to peel back the curtain here. I'm going to talk about some secrets of our industry, and I'm even going to talk about a couple myths and maybe bust them or maybe propagate them. Who knows? I'm a wild card. Job titles represent job responsibilities. Um, we're going to do a giant myth bust on this. Like I said, you can, I've been a security engineer three times and never has the job had anything to do with anything other than we want a smart person to do cybersecurity. The same word in English, seal and seal, crane and crane, bow and bow, it can mean a lot of different things. And I think that really helps you understand that what a role is can change drastically and what a title is. What you really need to focus on, and I know there's some talks about this later today that I'm excited to watch, are around what the job, you know, what are the things that are in the job description? And also, if you can, uh, if I can borrow the phrase hack, if you can get in and network with people who work in that role, um, what are they actually looking for versus what is the HR boilerplate for that role? Uh, a perfect example here, my very good friends, Rebecca Brown and Scott Roberts, they have the exact same job. They have the exact same title. They work for the exact same Fortune 100 company. They could not have more different backgrounds or different personalities or different focuses for how they execute on their job. Uh, they are co-authors and besties around the world. Um, they both were, they wrote a book called Intelligence Driven Incident Response. And to give you an idea, Rebecca is a terrifying Marine woman. Um, she is an Intel analyst through and through. She speaks fluent Chinese. She's just an incredible human being, but she focuses on Intel and she has applied her skills in Intel into the realm of cybersecurity, much to the benefit literally of society. Um, Scott Roberts is a neckbeard computer science graduate, right? He went from PSU. He is a developer. He really is fascinated by automating and scaling and doing things faster and bigger and better, along with being incredibly knowledgeable about adversaries and intelligence groups. So I, I say this because you could apply to this job and be extremely technical or extremely Intel analyst focused and still get on the same team with the same job title and the same job responsibilities. Don't let those things kind of get in the way of what you're applying for or what you're looking for. At the same time, don't be disappointed if you apply for a job because you're a security engineer and what they're offering is not what you thought it was going to be. You have to be technical. Um, this comes up a lot in the Twitter sphere and LinkedIn, you'll see virulent um, testimonies of you have to be technical, this is the route, um, or you know, no one has to be technical, there's a lot of different places and that's gatekeeping. I fall frankly a little bit in the middle. I do think there's a certain level of knowledge, that, of technical knowledge you have to have to work in our community. Uh, if you are unable to explain what an IP address is, you are probably not going to be um, extremely successful in our career. That's just a fact. That's very specific taxonomy and language around. But I will push back on the word technical. I don't actually know what that means. So don't self-select out because you think a job is super technical or someone says, oh yeah, these are very technical roles. Once again, you may not know what that actually is. And a perfect example of this is in my survey, I asked people, do you consider your role to be highly technical? And over 70%, 75 ish percent of people said, yes, I am a very highly technical role. My definition of highly technical, because I struggle at development, is Python or writing code. Um, like I could never do what Scott Roberts does. I think he is an incredibly technical human being. Um, he works and does things that I can't do. Um, but I think most people at my company, and if you've seen any of my talks on machine learning, I think for the most part, my community thinks that I am an extremely technical cybersecurity person, um, which I think is relevant because when I ask people, how do you rate your coding or development skills, one out of 10, one being horrible and 10 being great, and five being, I can get stuff to work if I cut and paste it, you know, the average rating was 5.8. So even though a huge majority of people said that they had a very technical job, only 5.8 of them, or, you know, most people said that they had a 5.8 on a technical scale of one to 10. So they may think that they have a very technical job, but how I define very technical was not the case. 
So just know that there's a lot of personal biases here of what you do and what you think. And I believe Rick Holland has a talk later on today that's gonna to go into some of those biases as well. So just know that everyone has their own baggage, everyone has their own definition, um, and don't get thrown off by what those things mean. Try to do whatever you want, frankly. Um, certs are dumb or certs are the most important things in the world. Um, you'll see this spin up. Um, I just wanna address this because I see this come up a lot with people I mentor of what search do I need to get to be most successful. And if you talk to someone like me, who's been in the industry for a very long time and has a gray beard or a graying beard, um, you'll see a lot of people who are of my generation cybersecurity start doing things like, let my CISP expire, it's so liberating, or who needs a GSE anymore, it seems dumb. I don't agree with that comment. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to cut the same piece of bread. When I look at what certs are, and of course I'm talking to a SANS group here, um, they can be a little cultish sometimes if you've never been involved with um, certifications. And you know, people get really into having a lot of long alphabetic words or alphabet soup after their name. That's really important if you work in an industry like as a cybersecurity consultant. Um, you, know, you need to be able to establish that credibility right away. I do think there's a little bit of gatekeeping, gatekeeping for people who say certs are dumb when you've been in the industry for 20 years. Because the reason that I don't need certs anymore is I have 20 year corpus of data for people to look back and say, oh yeah, Ryan Kovar knows what he's talking about. He has 20 talks at SANS. He's spoken at Black Hat. He's spoken at DEF CON. Um, yeah, I don't need a cert anymore because I've proven that I know what I'm talking about through public discourse. If you're in early career, a certification is invaluable because that's the only way that I know that someone else has evaluated what you've done. And the more prestigious the certification, the more likely someone is to say, oh, that's great. I don't have to worry about what they're saying on their resume. When I asked the respondents of the survey, what were the most valuable certifications? Um, CISSP came up, GIAC, GCIH, Security Plus immediately popped up. Um, I think the CISP, CISSP, this could be a little bias of my data set because I do come from the government world. And if you're in the department, you know, the defense industrial base or government space, you have to have, like literally, you cannot get a job without a CISSP as a government regulation. Um, so I think a lot of people who worked in the Department of Defense or government have a CISSP. Um, you know, SAM certs are great. In fact, um, and SANS can send me an honorarium check for this stat afterwards. Of all the certifications that people mentioned, 45% of them were actually certs from SANS. Uh, I think that's a credit to the instructors and the program. Um, they're not cheap. I think everyone on the call knows this, uh, but people do value them. And if you get something like a GIAC, if you are able to get something like a GSE, I have never met someone who has a GSE who I did not think was hot shit. Um, but, um, they are phenomenal. Like they are an architect driven, like these are really high level domains. So go get those if that's what you wanna do um, and don't worry about it. Saying that, interesting fact, when I asked people what the least valued uh, certifications were, CISP, Security Plus, CH, um, I'm not going into the value or not of these. Uh, what I still say about CISSP is I believe that it is a phenomenal cert for people from a, um, almost from a, a survey point of view. It really gives you a landscape of all the things that occur. Also, there's a lot of disagreement because some of the same certs that people said were the most valuable were simultaneously the ones that people said were the least valuable. Take it and leave it. There's not a lot of agreement there. Um, I think you should do what you feel is right for the roles and the buckets that you want to fill the most. I have to contribute to open source projects. Um, I see this a lot for people who say, hey, I work eight hours a day. Why should I have to do extra work on top of things to be able to get into these jobs? Um, I look at this once again, if you don't have a lot of things on your resume yet, um, an open source contribution is a good way for people who are hiring to look into things that you're working on. I certainly don't think it's required. If you have a full job and you have a full family life, you should do what you want to. But realize that it is very valuable a lot of times to hiring managers. It also gets you to be part of the community that you can work in and see more of what's happening. For example, if I'm hiring for a role that is going to have a lot of Yara signature creation, and I see that you have an active GitHub where you've been pushing out your own Yara signatures, that makes a much easier discussion about what you've done and being able to see going forward. To understand defense, you have to work in the help desk. I see this a lot for people who have long gray beards like me, uh, because you will not find, in my opinion, anyone who's over 40 years old or 35 years old who started in cybersecurity. I, I think David and um, Phil both kind of hit about this. 
you know, you start working in the help desk, you start as a network admin, you started as a Linux admin. We didn't have college degrees, we didn't have SANS. Um, so for us, we say, oh, well, the way you learn basic networking is you sit and you answer help desk emails. I say, screw all of that. This is a whole different world. Uh, we have SANS, we have all these different training options. You can get a degree in cybersecurity, something that did not exist when I was going through. Um, there's a lot of value in starting at the bottom of the IT stack because you can learn things viscerally that you're not going to be able to learn from a book, but don't get hung up on other people's world. Um, there's a lot of different places to go. I have to be on a leadership track. I already touched on this. Um, I am a huge proponent of individual contributors. Um, in Silicon Valley and other organizations, you can find incredible roles that allow you to grow more senior in a company while just becoming an individual contributor versus a manager. Um, if that's something of interest for you, I'm just saying don't rule out staying in IC for your entire career. There are career paths that you can choose that allow you to become extremely senior and valued in a company. Um, like for example, the title distinguished uh, or fellow, you'll see that for people who are individual contributors. I'm not a manager, I'm a leader. I'm absolutely a leader in my company, but I'm not a manager because I don't wanna do time cards for people. So just know that there's different paths you can take uh, for all these different job roles that I've been talking about. Final part I wanna say here, um, I see a lot of people intimidated by how much knowledge people have. Um, I know if like, for example, one of the most valuable courses I ever took was the SANS GREM. Uh, it's the most valuable course because I absolutely understood nothing after day three. Uh, and what I learned there is that Lenny Zeltzer is one of the most brilliant men I've ever talked to. And I understood nothing about assembly and I was not gonna understand anything after day three. And what I found there was that's okay. And I'm not intimidated by all these things that other people know because all the new technologies come out and you can become a worldwide expert in two years if you have a solid base. And I say this as an example of my 24 years of knowledge, a large chunk of it is that I can still defrag a priv.edp and pub.edp of an Exchange 5.5 server on Windows NT4 with Service Pack 3. That's still in my head. I could sit down at a keyboard today and do that. Unless I go work at the cybersecurity museum for elderly cybersecurity employees, there's never going to be any use for that knowledge. What I don't have knowledge for is how to scale up a Kubernetes cloud cluster, right? So the point is, once you have a certain level, we're always constantly learning. I have a lot of wisdom now from my 20 plus years of experience, but the knowledge is constantly refreshing and don't feel held back just because you're new to the field. Um, last thing I wanna talk about here, I have strong feelings about calling our field cyber or infosec. Uh, this is definitely the myth busting area. Um, here's the response from the data. Do you call it cybersecurity or information security? I was overwhelmingly happy with the term. I use both terms dependent, uh, in, you know, depending on the audience. So most people said I use them interchangeably depending on who I talk to. I was talking to David about this earlier uh, this week and we discussed, um, like I said, oh, that's an interesting finding. And he said, yeah, well, I believe that cybersecurity is a domain or a, a sub-discipline of information security. And I think that's a wonderful way to put it. The way I think about it is cybersecurity for me is around adversarial action. So if I'm a threat hunter, if I'm a cyber threat intelligence analyst, I do cybersecurity things, that's what I do. Uh, if I work in compliance or regulation, or if I'm acting as a CISO or I'm assisting a business, to me, that's more information security things. Um, but all of that honestly falls under that InfoSec umbrella. So if you're confused about a cybersecurity engineer versus an InfoSec engineer or a cyber job versus an InfoSec job, just know there's no difference. They do the same thing. Um, my final conclusion here and uh, going forward, my dubious fortune telling, um, as we said earlier, do not buy stock in anything I'm saying. And if I ruin your future career, blame David for inviting me today. Here's the word cloud of all the different jobs that the people who responded to my survey thought were the most interesting, hottest things that are coming up. Um, you see engineer pops up, cloud, cloud, cloud. That's why I used to cloud for word cloud. It's meta, meta, meta. Uh, hopefully this isn't too meta for your morning. DevSecOps. I had to do some data grooming here because people answered in pros. And I put this data up on the um, GitHub. But the big things that I see here grouped are people were like, hey, cloud, you got to get into that. 
And this was cloud analysts, this was cloud automation, this was Kubernetes, this was all sorts of different things. Uh, after that was anything to do with data science or machine learning. Um, these are basic places that people thought. After that, it gets a little fuzzy, analyst threat hunting, red team. Um, you know, there's a lot of different jobs in there that I was able to bucket through. GRC, governance, risk and compliance. Um, if you always wanna feed your family and you find rules and regulations to be extremely exciting, boy, do I have a career field for you. Um, if there is one thing that will always exist past any other job or any other hot new topic, it will be something around compliance. Um, you will always feed your family and have very nice vacations to Hawaii if you work in GRC. If you find that at all interesting, I highly recommend going into that route. So my hot takes for the future, um, DevSecOps, I, I honestly believe if we go back to the very beginning of my talk where I talked about Susan's buckets, um, think about not necessarily what jobs you wanna take, but think about the skills that you're gonna need for the future going forward. And if we synthesize what people said were the hottest new jobs, I would say the things that are most hot right now to learn that I have in my bucket list for the next five years, I need to learn DevSecOps, um, not to plug SANS again, and they literally do not pay me, um, but they have a phenomenal DevSecOps course. My good friend, Dave Harrell just went through it and I am very envious of all the knowledge that he's dropping. Um, if you're not automating things, you're dying. That's just the God honest truth. Um, you can't scale or create if you don't know how to automate, which directly ties into big data wrangling. Um, the data sets that we deal with now, even at small companies, are terabytes and petabytes. Uh, if you want to do analysis of those, either as a red teamer or a blue teamer, you have to be able to come up with a way to automate and wrangle that data. Um, I don't think I have to tell anyone here as we speak on Zoom around the world during a pandemic that everything to do with cloud is going to be useful because that is where data is going to live for the next five to 10 years until, as those of us with enough wizard beards will say, everything will then go immediately back to your desktop. And all we do is bounce back and forth between mainframes and personal computing in our industry. Uh, the final thing I wanna leave you with is if you haven't thought about storytelling as a, a bucket, really think about it. And by storytelling, I mean communicating and being able to communicate verbally, being able to communicate via written prose has been the single biggest force multiplier for my personal career uh, that I can think of. And every person you're gonna hear from today has some aspect of being a storyteller. Um, and I highly recommend, if it's not something you're good at, there's a lot of different ways to, to do that. Uh, some people are phenomenal authors, some people are phenomenal speakers, but find a way to share your knowledge and communicate what you do for a living to other people. It'll help you both in your day job and for your next career. So here's the bucket list. Go forward for the rest of the day and think about how you wanna fill your bucket list. Take Susan's advice. She is not only an incredible human being, she's one of the most successful human beings I've ever met. Um, it really helped me organize my life and my career. Hopefully it will help you. If there's one thing you can take away from my long narrative in the beginning here of all the things that I do is I'm not actually a subject matter expert in anything. I am a subject matter expert in getting very good at something very quickly and then moving on to the next thing. And I think many of us in the industry would actually say the same. Um, this is very much a Kovar hot take, depending on how you want to go. Uh, but if you dedicate your life to the very, very smallest specialization, um, for those of you on the call uh, who were Novell admins in 1999, you know that there can be danger in being a little bit too focused in something. And one of the feedback I got on my survey, uh, I, I just love this quote. And so if you're on, thank you. There's always a new hotness for understanding how the pieces fit together explicitly implicitly and non-existently is where the magic has been for my entire career. I love that term. I love that phrase. Uh, I could put that on a shirt and wear it proudly. It certainly describes my entire career. Um, so don't walk away from this thinking you have to pick one role or other. There's a lot of places you can fit in and be super successful. So with that, I will conclude and turn back over to my lovely host. Uh, my name is Ryan Kovar. I work at Splunk. You can find me on Twitter at MeanSec. Um, I promise I'm mostly nice, but I am extremely average. Uh, thank you for your time.